Hi, I'm Jerry Boyer. This is Meeting of Minds podcast. My guest is Andy Alavastro, who's the Vice President of Outreach at the Heritage Foundation. Andy, thanks for being with us. Jerry, great to see you. Thank you for having me. So we're, so we're kind of in a funny position. Yeah. You know, podcasting is theater of the mind, so we're kind of leaned over. We're at the Alliance Defending Freedom Conference. We just finished the corporate engagement track, and we're just like finding a little corner here, and it's not chairs, so we're kind of leaning. The ceiling yeah. looks like it has good acoustics. So let's hope that helps. <laughs> it does. Yeah, The sound is good. I'm liking the sound. It's, it feels good. I'm worried about the scoliosis of leaning over for this whole time, yeah. right? Yeah, it could be an issue. Especially at your age. Yeah. I mean, that's right. going to be... <laughs> You know, something you have to watch out for. Well, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I have that. no comment. To no, that. You, do, you don't have to. You're a lot younger than I am. So, uh, all right. So, um, Vice President of Outreach um, yes. at Heritage. And I think particularly I associate you, sort of the new direction that I'm seeing that I associate with you is taking the issues to the corporate boardroom as opposed to. Um, there's a, always conservative think tanks in Washington have understandably had a focus on politics and policy. That's right. Great. Yep. Because it's important, right? right. Absolutely. Uh, and then there's also been litigation. Alliance Defending Freedom is focused on that, but you guys do amicus briefs. That's also important because right. leftism made courts very important, more important than they constitutionally are supposed to be. But while, while all that was going on, we were winning elections, we were winning policy debates, we were winning court cases, and then we were losing elections for boards of directors and proxies at corporate annual meetings and we essentially lost corporate america is, is, is that is you agree with that scenario i agree with that scenario our friend justin danoff has a saying that uh, corporate america and whether you would say they were ever really republican or conservative corporate america and the republican party and the conservative movement divorced about 40 years ago but we just found the paperwork in the top drawer of the desk yeah yeah i see yeah. we have and and they've been carrying on with somebody else they've been carrying on with somebody else quite a bit yeah, yeah. the and left I think, the i e s g i'm sorry go yeah, ahead no i was just i was just going to say about heritage i think you're right um you know we, we're blessed with a great leadership team there and, and just a wonderful group of of uh of teammates across the entire organization kevin roberts who's our new president um there's sort of three things i would want your listeners to think about heritage one we are on offense every day all day all gas no breaks the second is that we believe it is our job to protect the american people from the authoritarian biden regime we will do that we will speak up on every issue and the third is that we've launched a project project 2025 which is about staffing the next friendly administration which certainly we can talk more about but we are all about being on offense being action oriented and the last thing i would add is that the heritage foundation is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary next year but more than just being a think tank, we are action oriented. We have our heritage action arm, our lobbying arm, and we have the Daily Signal media outlet. Right, so, right. you know, it is it is a, it is about a posture of being forward and on action. And, and yeah, on and I've seen I've seen Daily Signal do a lot of coverage on this issue. That's on, right on corporate on corporate issues. I think on we've even what we call we, woke capitalism. That's right. I think we even interviewed a guy named Jerry Boyer. He's very knowledgeable on this topic. Well, yeah, it's tough to keep the standards up. I get that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have you have to do a newsletter every day. But yes, that's I right. think that happened. But I'm that's sure right. someone in quality control will intervene. That's right. But but to your to your point you were making earlier and then and then how you and I have gotten to know each other, you know, we wanted to stand up some coalitions, we wanted to work in this space, we wanted to look at what was going on in corporate America and in the business community. And one of the things that that I really liked about working with you Jerry was that we're not the walk away people, right? We're right. not going to leave and and walk away. We're not going to take our ball and go home. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, I think the, the analogy when I've talked about that is uh Jesus and the rich young ruler. Right. You know, they have a confrontation over socialism, by the way, um, it's it's not over whether wealth is good or bad. Uh, he's a rich young ruler. He's a senator. He's an archon. I'm not going to bore you with that, but I wrote a book about it, so I'm going to bore everybody else with it. Um, so they, you know, clashed over a lot of these issues. But who walked away? It was it was the bureaucrat. It was the senator who right. couldn't stand the truth. Jesus didn't walk away. So we're not the ones who should be walking away from these companies. So um, all right. So the the um, I think Heritage has probably done a lot better than most of the conservative institutions in Washington in responding to grassroots concerns. In other words, what the grassroots are, are concerned about. I was involved with the Tea Party movement, and Heritage was right there, right, right away. When a lot of folks, I won't mention other names, but a lot of folks were like, oh, I don't know. Is, you know, the wrong kind of people are there. Heritage was like, here's research on the Constitution, here's how it works, you know, backing. So to what degree is this coming from the grassroots saying, hey, listen, we're really concerned about woke capitalism, and we want you to speak to it. How much is this sort of demand driven by, by the people? I, I, I think it, 
I think we've captured something um, that is demand driven by the people, but I, I would say that there are facets to it that um, probably don't manifest themselves at kitchen table uh, conversations uh, mm -hmm. across America. Uh, at least they didn't, you know, two years ago. Uh, the, the example would be, you know, if I want to go buy a brand of sneakers or I want to go shop at a store, I shouldn't have to feel bad about it. I shouldn't have to walk through the door or go online and think that, you know, this company doesn't have the same values as I do. Mm. Um, and so in the past, I think people would say, I'm just going to boycott that company. And certainly that can be effective. But at the same time, if we don't take our ball and go home, well, what do we want to do? Well, we want to go engage those companies. We want to say, you know, you're making bad decisions. You're doing the wrong thing. You're being co-opted by um, – by the left and companies I think heretofore haven't had to deal with that in the much the same way but like you are have been so active and you've been a leader in shareholder activism and, and driving this conversation inside inside the meetings that our company leadership uh, taking the direction from their owners uh, they have to be responsive they have to listen to this conversation well you know that's that's an important point and by the way I got to mention I was mentored by Justin Danhoff, who does this better than anybody, right? And, I, and Justin guy. introduced us. Yes. Um, uh, so I, I'm doing it, but I'm not first. I wasn't first into battle. I, maybe not. I wasn't second into battle either. Um, but something occurred to me in this conference, which is a lot of the conversation is about cancel culture. And what that amounts to is the left has a set of arguments that are extremely fragile. Yes. Um, the prevalence of the arguments depends on the lack of challenge and yes. so a conservative comes to campus and the answer is shut up mm -hmm. and if you we don't shut up then the answer is we're going to scream so loud that effectively we've shut you up because no one can hear you that's right so they shut down the debate nobody who will win a debate shuts down a debate that's right right uh but that happens on college campuses all the time that's and right. it kind of happens on mainstream media Con serious conservative voices can't get on mainstream media so we can't have the debate but in corporate life, we can have the debate. Securities yes. law says yes. we can come, we can ask, we can put a proposal, we can vote, we can force the debate. So all of these issues where we feel locked out, we've got the better arguments, but we can't deliver them. Well, shareholder activism allows us to deliver all those wonderful arguments that Heritage Foundation has in its policy papers. I, I think that's right. And I think to, to tie a few threads of that together, you know, you talk about the commanding heights of the culture where the right maybe lost the business community or is, is at the point of po possibly losing the business community to the left, whether the business community should be right or left or should just be neutral player mm -hmm. in the market um, is, is, a, is a sort of different question. But the idea that the commanding heights of culture would dictate that you can't have these conversations in the workplace or anything is, I think, another part of this where an employee shouldn't feel afraid to bring uh, their ideas into the workplace. And so viewpoint diversity is of paramount importance. If I'm a shareholder in a company or I'm the CEO or I'm an executive in a corporation, a large company, and I'm spending $2 billion or more a year on research and development, mm -hmm. I want the best ideas. Right. I don't want people feeling stifled. I don't want people feeling that they can't express themselves. Right. And if, if you have that kind of environment, you will actually lose the opportunity to be innovative in the marketplace and, and, in, the, and in the sort of scope of corporate and, and um, corporate growth and globalization, many corporations would say, well, we are diverse because we have people in every market that represent our company and can mm -hmm. kind of bring in intelligence back to us. That's not the same thing as viewpoint diversity. And what happens now with the sort of diversity um, identity bingo that happens inside corporate America, right? I mean, that should be that should be an embarrassment to every corporate executive. Uh, they deserve the scrutiny if they endorse it, and they deserve ridicule if they endorse it loudly and and more often. Right, right. That's an interesting point you make. That their argument that we're diverse because we have a global workforce. Well, okay. What about headquarters? Yeah. Right. And is the board diverse? And diverse includes different ways of thinking if you've got a if you've got people of different races and different genders and they all went to an Ivy League school and they all bought the Ivy League ideology that's not diversity I think I think that might work if you um, if your product is a uh, Ivy League college textbook perhaps yeah, that's true, right? that's true. Um, and it is big business work. it is big business <laughs> but but I think that's right and I think that it, it it should force us to unpack diversity even more yeah are you once you put a checklist together are you still diverse right once you mandate once the government comes in and mandates some diversity are you still diverse yes right so Boston Consulting right. Group McKinsey Harvard Business Review they'll publish scores of studies about how diversity and diverse businesses diversity will help a business or diverse businesses will grow faster and all right. these things right but once you put borders on what that is or somebody else defines it for your business 
then it I, no I longer like reflects the culture. Uh, yeah, I thought about this because yeah. I've actually done analytics on gender diversity in boards. Right. Right. I'm not trying to be political, but I, was, I just wrote a white paper last week on this. Right. Uh, companies um, whose boards of directors have no women mm -hmm. do indeed underperform. Right? right, and that would make sense to me. And it's not politics; it's, that's what the that's what the the data is saying. But you can look at that and say, okay, that's true. And then if California comes along, right. uh, or the European Union comes along and says, we command, thou shalt and must have a woman on the board. That's not the same dynamics as a corporation that chooses that's to right. do that. Right? That's right. What you're going to get is a tiny pool of board pre-approved women who are going to be on. 30 board, 50 boards right. making a, a fortune right. and you're not going to have any more diversity. Right. right. And I mean, and at some point, at some point, um, you, you can slice it so thin that you actually uh, are not broadly reflecting um, the candidate or pool that you would want to. I mean, I think right. you know, one, right. of, one of the things that's been great about this ADF conference um, where you and I have been, been working with a lot of great partners and colleagues, but also speaking on a panel. Um, I mean, there's a general sense that there's more awareness about this. There's a better understanding about how um, DEI or ESG has sort of poisoned the well um, and is purely cover for leftist politics. Uh, and and so that that's why there's. I mean, when I go to a conference and the mm -hmm. mood is this positive and there's mm -hmm. this much energy, I feel really good about that. Yeah, and you know? I'm feeling that too. Yeah. Yeah, they, it, they, they they went too far. It's, they went too far. We, we can so much sense how overextended their lines are. I think that's true. Right. I think that's true. And it, and when I think about you know, let's not take our ball and go home, but you know. ADF has released the viewpoint diversity index. You and I are on that advisory board. Right. You know, the launch of something like that isn't isn't a isn't a one off celebration, but you establish a baseline now. And if I'm a corporation out there, if I'm a CEO of a corporation, I want my business in that index. Yeah. I want to show that I respect and honor and treasure viewpoint diversity. Right, right. All right, uh, tough question. Sure. ESG. Yes. Uh, fix it redeem it make our version of it or destroy it destroy it smash it and destroy it um i i think that it is um the easiest way to look at that is somebody like larry fink who has decided that the umbrella of esg gives him the authority to take uh, people's money and use it to attack their own values mm. to take investors money and to bet on china yeah. and to do it in a way that he will then say to the wall street journal to the new york times and his own investor shareholder letter to say that we are going to change behaviors we are going to achieve net zero to do all the things that nobody voted for him to do at all right um and the more he's put to the test on it the more i think um, the fissures will be seen, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking for a new job at the beginning of next year. What, what did Sam Zell say? Uh, I like Larry Fink, but who elected him emperor? <laughs> That's right. Right. And Robert, Zell, Robert yeah. Munger. Uh, Munger. Uh, yeah. Munger said. Uh, I Charlie don't know which Munger. one said. Charlie Munger yeah. said something like, "When? When did? No. Okay. It was Zell who said, "When did Larry Fink become God?" That's right. Right. And Munger said, "Who, who elected him emperor?" Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's a lot of power to give to, <laughs> to yeah. Uh, some. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the way I look at it, ESG was created from the very beginning because there's something they didn't like. The thing they didn't like is shareholder capitalism. Right. They didn't like the Milton Friedman model, which is right. the job of the business to make a profit for the shareholders. Right. Um, otherwise, why even create a thing, right? right? Why create this new brand if right. you already agree with shareholder capitalism? This is the alternative. It's like, well, we everybody's a constituent. You know, the planet is a constituent, <laughs> and the polar bears and the penguins yeah. are constituent, right. and the unions. Yeah. We we work for everybody. And if a CEO has got things arranged so that he works for everybody, yeah. that really means he works for nobody. That's because right. he decides at any given moment who, which That's stakeholder right. he's, he's working That's for. That's right. Everyone's yeah. a stakeholder. Right. Um, I, I agree with that completely. I, I think, um, you know, the the antidote to uh, to that line of thinking is to go back and look at what Milton Friedman wrote. And, you know, it probably needs um, to be updated for our time, even though the ideas were still right and mm -hmm. true. Where Friedman said, I'm not telling anybody that, you know, um, that you can't take shareholder dollars mm -hmm. and use them to spend on anything you want. Just tell them that that's what you're doing. Yes, right. And if you want to empower a managerial class right. to take resources that capital that would be otherwise invested in product design or product creation or something along those lines uh, in employee salaries and things right. like that. If right. you want to take that money and do something else with it, just say that that's what you're doing. Yeah. But don't say that, don't say that that's 
a decision that the shareholders would possibly want. Now, you can put that to a bunch of shareholders, and they may choose to, to vote for it, but as you know as Except well as Except they, they never have. Except they never have. Exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, ISS endorsed one, at least one of them. I noticed that. That was amazing to me, and I talked to them about it. So, th I mean, there is a public benefit corporation. You can do that. You can file as a public benefit corporation. You can say in advance, going back to the marriage analogy, you can. Right. it's like an open marriage. You know, you're our shareholder, but we've got other stakeholders too. So, you know, we can date other, other constituencies and if you want to sign up for that, that's fine. But nobody ever signs up for that. They sign up for companies where the shareholders are in charge. That's right. But then they get companies where the shareholders aren't in charge because they signed Larry Fink's business roundtable stakeholder capitalism thing. That's right. Uh, and any time now, what's really interesting about that point that you make, Jerry, is that there are people on the left, on the academic left, and others who want to um, also chastise Larry Fink or even the Business Roundtable because they don't believe that these commitments are real hmm. and they want to see it uh, codified through SEC regulations and a sort of Biden administration whole of government approach right. to uh, to do to advance these things and to and to lock them into law and to and into the regulatory agencies. That's that's the point. I mean, yeah. they are looking for mechanisms and control, uh, and and I think power. And I think that um, you know ESG has been the shoehorn by yeah. which the left has done what you said, which is that which they couldn't accomplish through uh, through the ballot box. And I've always said that corporate social responsibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and environmental, social, and governance. CSR, DEI, ESG is the alphabet soup of extortion. Yeah, it really is. Well, you know, it's interesting. Is it real or not? And I guess what I would argue is it is real, but it's not really what it says it is. It is a real strategy to break shareholder primacy and transfer power to the managerial class. It has real effects. It doesn't have real positive environmental effects. It doesn't have real positive social effects. It That's doesn't right. have real positive government. It doesn't do anything good in terms of ES and G, but it doesn't leave things as it are. It provides the justifying rationale for a CEO to do whatever he darn well pleases. Well, and, and, and you and I have had the conversation about the fact, I agree with you, you and I have had the conversation about the fact that there's also no good definition of ESG. Right. And so it'll, it's very malleable to what somebody wants it to be. But what's very interesting is that many other proponents will always point to sort of UN sustainable development goals and mm -hmm. these sort of things. And there is no way that at Davos or at the World Economic Forum or at the UN that there is anybody looking at this as a means of profit and anything else that would benefit uh, society in the way that we know that successful businesses can, right. because successful businesses do improve the human condition. Right. They're looking at it as a means to, uh, literally to control the means of production. They are looking to right. insert themselves right. in, in between the business operations and the actual owners of those cap of that capital, which is the share owners. Yeah, right. Um, it's a legacy issue for them, a lot of them. It's almost like an apotheosis. It's almost like it's not enough to be a business manager. You have to be a god king who saves humanity. You have to be a platonic philosopher king. Right. I mean, once once you've become a billionaire, right, right, right. you're on the fifth wife, you know, <laughs> That's right. she's younger than your daughter, um, you got everything, you got you know, 20 houses, what's next? I guess it's divinization. You know? I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they say that every U.S. senator sees a president in the mirror. Right. Um, I'm sure that every major corporate CEO, you know, he or she sees a president or, or a divine yeah. uh, image in the mirror. What's interesting in my time in corporate America, you, you know, is that there's just as much politics in corporate America as there is in politics itself. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is CEOs, men and women that are CEOs, they're, they don't understand the scrutiny that politicians go through, and so they're not really prepared for it in the same way. Yeah. And that's the other thing that, candidly, um, we will apply pressure on those people because if, if their actions are undermining our culture or undermining our capital and thereby our property, right. then I think honest questions are deserved, that scrutiny is deserved, and the ridicule that follows is very much necessary. Yeah, that's a good point. CEOs are more vulnerable than politicians. I think that's because right. Because politicians have developed the skill set from when they were first on the school board. That's right. On up through state legislature and on up to senator or whatever, they learned how to protect themselves against that. Right. But the CEO doesn't have the protection protection because everyone's kissing the ring all day then they go out into the public sphere and they expect applause and they don't get it well I mean I mean if you're to your point earlier when you were sort of enumerating all the different stakeholders that a CEO might uh, might seek to uh, to um, to um, to please how much of a leader are you 
Right. If you're if if that's your job, then you're just a ticket taker. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? And right. so you know whether one says the archetype is right or not, but the idea of a CEO, he or she, walking down the hall in the corporate headquarters, calling the shots, right. walking into the boardroom and exerting their will. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that exists anymore. And if I was the CEO of a major corporation, I would want to exert some will and I would want to tell all these lefty organizations that are trying to commandeer my people and my products and my business and I'd tell them to get out of my boardroom. Well, and I think that's starting to happen. I think, I think right. that the, the outsized ego is kind of helpful here. That's because true. Because it's like, okay, hey, I'm going to say something that's um, progressive and you get a little bit of applause. Oh, I like that. Okay. And then, okay, so I'm done, right? I sign the roundtable statement or mm. I, we have a gay pride day. I'm done. I'm No, no. They come back next year and they want more. Your human rights campaign 100% scorer, mm. now that, that's, there's an inflation built into that. You have to do more things and more things and it's unappeas- unappeasable. That's and right. eventually some of these very liberal CEOs, like even a Tim Cook, are like... I, no more resolutions. Shut up. Let me run the business. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And and then candidly, they also want to um, you know make sure that you know if it's um, I think it was GRI or maybe it was Carbon Disclosure Project. But there's all these organizations that want you to disclose on your website all of this information about your supply chains and all these things. I mean, there's a competitive challenge to all of this. Sure there's there proprietary information Absolutely. involved in all this, right. but they want to get their hands on this so that they can manipulate the way the businesses operate. They can manipulate the supply chain and then they can go all the way through to say, if you're not even, if you're a private supplier to a public company, we've mm-hmm. got our hands on you. Yes. I mean, it changes the dynamics of the business marketplace. Yeah, they lose control. They lose con- And if they're, di- if they're diverging all that stuff, they're losing control of their supply chain. Okay. You know, wh- you know, one of the things that really stood out to me in this shareholder season was the BlackRock annual meeting. That's right. Right. Because BlackRock is out there at all these annual meetings yeah. pushing ESG stuff, mm-hmm. pushing stakeholder capitalism. Right. So some BlackRock shareholder, uh, bless him, had the audacity <laughs> to BlackRock BlackRock. Right. He put, right. put a proposal saying, you support stakeholder capitalism. You can't do that with your current business model. So mm-hmm. your ESG, which means you have to count the social cost of everything you do. So we, what, we need you to change your business model and we need you to report the social cost of everything that you engage in to minimize the cost of society of all the companies you invest in. And Larry Fink was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I mean, they did, it was just double talk. <laughs> it, it <laughs> nothing to say to that because you know blackrock doesn't want to be blackrocked well, right sure uh, they don't want to eat their own cooking no and and uh and kennelly they've created a, an environment where people are going to go right through the front door and take some of their business away as a result of that you i'm know? seeing that yeah. yeah and and we'll see i think more of that um and uh we know people that are that are building those those companies right now right and and i think you know if you think about larry fink and you think about the way that blackrock has done business I mean, I, if you had told me a year ago, two years ago, that Larry Fink would be synonymous with bad business and bad corporate behavior and cuddling up, uh, cuddling up with China, I mean, sure. But I didn't think the American people would tap into that, but they sure have. I mean, what a great campaign by uh, whoever was doing those ads. I think Consumers Research on CNBC. Yes. You know, just highlighting that, you know, and, 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 getting, um, and getting a lot of people to pay attention to that. I, it's remarkable. Uh, and it's remarkable at how, how much the American people are already aware of it, yes. already knew it was happening and are disgusted by it right. and he's going to have to And no credit that. from the left. No. They're, 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 you can't appease them so they're not going to protect them. They want no. them to go too. No. And I don't, I'm not sure he can survive for long as a CEO. I don't think, I wouldn't think so. I mean, if I was on that board, I would be asking him questions on how this is beneficial to our business and I think right. they probably have models that show that, that it is because they charge more mm-hmm. for some of these uh, vanity things that, that are under the ESG umbrella. But, I mean, we know they handle a lot of money, but they just lost more money than they've ever lost in the last quarter, right? I think that right. came out a couple right. of days ago. So right. Right. Um, they're going to face some headwinds, but they're headwinds that they've created because of the way they're doing business and the way they're trying to manipulate the marketplace. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, in the end, they look, BlackRock grew by acquisition. Right. Right. It's not organic growth. So that's a kind of an ego kind of driven thing. In the end, capital is going to go. What did Walter Riston say? Capital is going to go where where it's wanted and stay where it's well treated. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think that the ESG bubble is popping, not just for BlackRock, but for everybody. And I think the um, the huge performance of the energy industry that we've seen yes. over the past couple of years was what did it, because getting people out of fossil fuels was it, it may, may have sounded great but the opportunity cost of that was huge so the, it, it made a esg any esg that actually changed the portfolio 
Like some of it's just like pixie dust. I mean, it's basically the same portfolio, right? Right. Um, right. But anything that actually changed the portfolio had to severely cut back on fossil fuels, and that is, and, and also industrial materials, and that's exactly where the growth has been. So everyone can be ESG when there's no drawdown and there's no negative alpha, there's no negative mm -hmm. performance. But getting killed on performance is really what what I think is, uh, you know, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. All this, all the, <laughs> uh, you know, all the. I just had a Larry. Fink picture right, in my head, please. Right. Got to get rid of that. That's on you. That's on you. Someone, yeah. um, you know. Do you at least have a scarf on? <laughs> <laughs> does, does, is the scarf made in China? That's what I want to know. The scarf is made in China, uh, which means you can't rely on it to stay on. That's right? Right. It dissolves That's right. in water. It dissolves in water. <laughs> so with with the bear market, and if we're heading into a recession, or I'm saying probably in one now, um, that that's kind of the death knell of the ESG bubble, in my opinion. I think energy markets are... I think what you just articulated is absolutely correct. I think that if you energy reliable, affordable, accessible energy mm -hmm. is the story of what makes civilizations flourish. Right? right, it's right there with many other things, along with you know uh, education and other things. Yeah. But but legitimately, it is what makes right. civilizations. Discovering flourish. Discovering fire was a biggie. Uh, it's a biggie. Right, right. it's a biggie. It wasn't like a right. side right. thing. And the wheel and the fire right. yeah, they made a big I mean, difference. It, it does. And. <laughs> and um, you know, and, and you've got people manipulating the marketplace right now because they don't like what they would say is fossil fuels. They mm -hmm. would say dirty energy and things like that. Right. But they want to transition to what they would call clean energy, but it's not reliable and it hasn't proven to be. And you can see that with what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and, and right. uh, with the way that Germany and other countries are having to, to counteract that. Um, and, uh, and even France and others that want to restart nuclear energy programs. Yeah. Um, you know, and so the idea that I think this is sort of paramount to the way the left thinks and, and and not to conflate a bunch of different issues but you know we were told that they were going to stop the rise of the oceans but they can't lift a finger to stop the wave of immigrants that crosses the border right mm -hmm. so I mean you just sort of have this you have this grandiose sort of, lectures this grandiose right? lectures and no real and no real and, and nothing yeah. that would be sort of sound policy right, based in right. in a robust idea that's that's you know consistent with American principles in that yeah. way. And maybe multinational companies, you know, lost their way a little bit. Right. They should they should come back. They should reevaluate that. Um, what has been, I think, uh, a great contributor to success across the globe. And people like to point to how many um, how many um, have come out of poverty in China. Right. And that's largely been through trade and other things like that. Right, right. But but, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is not our friend. They manipulate no. the marketplace. They manipulate their own people. And it's a shame uh, that they're given that much legitimacy on the world stage. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I mean, a multinational ESG and ESG helps them. It really does. That's what uh, I meant to say at the end. Multinational corporations are multinational in their operations, but they all have a domicile. That's right. Right. They have to live somewhere. There's some place where a corporation is a legal entity. Yes. And there are protections offered. And these American corporations are American corporations with a multinational business model. But it's the rule of law here which makes it possible. Um, they're, they're not headquartered in China. They're not headquartered in Russia where Putin could say, oh, a nice company. Thanks. You know, or even no thanks. Uh, here, have, have tea. It's good for you. Um, <laughs> no uh, comment. Yes. Whereas, you know, they... they they have to have some loyalty to the United States of America because that's their domicile with a legal structure that made them possible. Right. That's why we punch above our weight when it comes to multinational corporations so much, why we have such a large proportion of multinational corporations compared to our population mm -hmm. because of the rule of law tradition. Right. If they start chiseling away at that, mm -hmm. then they're undermining what makes them possible. You know, I, I think that you know, the progressive left hates nothing more than a successful business, a profit-making business. And so I think they were not able to uh, to shut them all down, despite right. their wishes, mm. uh, to seize the means of production on that. And so they found a way to do it in, mm. in this sense. And, um, you know, the result of that is, is that, you know, waking up to the arms race, as somebody this week said, said, you know, I mean, you just can't sit still on these things. But um, the way that business operates to satisfy i mean strip it down to this capitalism to its simplest uh forms you're creating you know you're you're using your your property whether it's in your mind or it's in your hands you're creating a product um and you're finding a marketplace for that right. i mean at, at its most base level capitalism is solving problems um trade uh is a net good thing and when it's you and i right here now and it's not used as a political weapon um but the left has never had a has never had a um, a comfort with 
um, somebody else's success. Yeah, you know, you mentioned property. It seems to me that shareholder capitalism yes. is simply the application of the principle of private property to Agreed. a particular market, right. financial markets. Right. ESG and stakeholder capitalism is simply the denial of the principle of private property in that same area. I think that that's profoundly stated, and I would agree. Uh, you're much smarter than I am, but the other thing I would add to that is well, that you're the vice president of outreach at Heritage, <laughs> the biggest think tank in in yeah, the universe. Well, so well, uh, you, you must know, have a few neurons there. To, they still synap the, fire, the synapses are firing every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, good. you know what we're focused <laughs> you're looking on. Looking good to me. Uh, thank you. Yeah. But what we're focused on is you know uh, is, is building and, and growing the conservative movement, and you know reaching out to known and new audiences and doing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, engaging targeted engagement with with those people because we know that. Um, we have a lot of friends out there that we talk to every day, but we also have a lot of people we haven't reached yet, and yeah, we know right. that they would want to hear from us, and we want to talk to them, and then we want to build coalitions to advance our policy priorities across the board. And, and one of these is, you know, to make America the best place to do business again. And, right. and part of doing that is to, is to, is you know, there's things you can do where the government's stepping in and they're regulating too mm -hmm. much or they're taxing too much and right. things like that. But this ESG phenomenon is really, uh, it's extra government, right? In, in a sense, it's above government. I mean, it's the it left that's weaponized their capital. Right. And in, our, in these cases, it's it's the capital of retirees, but the left has weaponized capital um, against uh, American citizens. And isn't it interesting, the Biden administration um, and, you know, agencies, SEC, whatever, Gensler, et cetera. Right. They are pushing so hard on this. But here's the thing. What they've told us is the people want this. Investors want this. This is good for investors. Um, this, is the, what, this is what the American people want. This is what the best financial minds want. Well, then what's with all the mandates? If we already want it, you know, no one has to come and say, here, Boyer, more ice cream. You have to you know, eat more ice cream. I already want ice cream. You don't have to make it illegal for me not to eat ice cream. Right. I, I mean, they are so mandate heavy on this at exactly the moment when Americans are like, wait, corporations are deciding our politics. The tell, the mandate is the tell yes. that people don't want it. Yeah, the left doesn't care what you do as long as it's mandatory. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. So um, anything else you want to say before um, um, we... No, I would, you know, listen, it's a, it's a thrill for me to be talking to you as, as I've told. as well. Thank you. But as I've told other people, you know, Jerry Boyer is the faith and freedom movement's triple threat. And, uh, and, and this is something triple that, threat. yeah, the triple threat, right? You're a journalist, you're an investor, you're an advisor. Mm -hmm. There's probably a few other hats you wear, but, um, you know, I, I've just been through. Pop, pop. Pop, pop. They're that's my, most that is one. my most important. That's the most yes, important one. That reaches. Well, yeah. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I've met your wife, and if she tolerates you, then you know, that's a good thing, too. <laughs> um, no, I, I would just say that, um, you know, for anybody out there that's an employee at a company, who's an investor of a company or a customer of a company, this private property, this is your property in so many ways. If you're an employee, your time, your talent, your expertise is being lent to this company. Now they're paying you for it, mm -hmm. but they might be able to pay you more if they weren't wasting your money in other ways. And if you're an investor in that company, you're certainly being robbed of opportunities to better leverage that capital. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're a customer, you may be paying higher prices because of all this. That's your money. Should you really be forced to pay for someone to uh, fly to get an abortion? Um, I don't, I mean, even if you're pro-choice, wouldn't you be pro-choice on that to say the shareholders shouldn't be forced to make the choice to fund somebody else's abortion? Um, so, yeah, yeah, good That's point. Exactly it's right. our money, right? Yeah. It's our, our money, money. It's our private values. property. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Andy Alavastro from Heritage. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jerry.